This video is a continuation of our previous video on solving linear programming problems by the simplest method. We shall refer to the same LP problem. That is, we would like to maximize 3x plus 2y subjects to the constraints 2x plus y is less than or equal to 6, x plus 2y is less than or equal to 8, where both x and y are non-negative. In the previous video, we discussed how to tackle this linear programming problem by the simplest method in algebraic form. I hope you understand and appreciate how the simplest method can efficiently solve linear programming problems. In this video, we shall present the simplest method in tabular form. If you have understood the algebraic method, then you should find the tabular form easy to follow. The only difference is the format of presentation. Please watch the previous video on the simplest method in algebraic form before proceeding with this video, because essential explanations were mentioned there. Now, let's move on. We have rewritten the optimization problem into standard form in our last video by adding slack variables as appropriate. This is the place we should start now. We now present these equations into tabular form. In the tabular form, we create a table which contains columns for each of the variables, Z and the right hand side constant. We will write our objective function into this form so that all the variables are moved to the left hand side with the coefficient of z to be positive 1 and the right hand side value to be 0. We shall first place the objective function to the table. This is the only row that consists of z. In the other rows, we place the constraints equations. We denote the column of right hand side constant to be ci. You can double check that all entries in this column should be non-negative. Please spare one column at the left of column EZ. We shall write some information here during our process. To distinguish the objective function from the other constraints, we draw a separation line here and name this row as row 0. The rows for the constraint equations are now row 1 and row 2, which are marked next to the columns of CI. We draw a straight line here and here for better presentation. We can now regard it as a system of linear equations with three equations and five unknowns. And we bear in mind that x, y, s1 and s2 are non-negative. Recall that in the algebraic method, we should now try to find a solution to this system of linear equations. Similar to the algebraic method, we want to find columns which has all entries equal to 0 except one entry which is 1. Ignoring the column of EZ, these two columns have all entry equal to 0 and one entry equal to positive 1. These two columns represent two variables, s1 and s2, which they appear in only one constraint equation with coefficient 1. These variables are called basic variables. So at this stage, s1 and s2 are the basic variables. In particular, s1 is basic in row 1 and s2 is basic in row 2. In our case, we will take x to be 0 and y to be 0. Then accordingly, the value of z will be 0. The value for our basic variables in this stage will be s1 equals to 6 and s2 equals to 8. Thus, we have this system in the first stage which corresponds to the pink system in the algebraic form. And we have obtained the same vertex in the feasible region as our starting point, 
with z equals to zero. Similar to the algebraic method, we now make a judgment on whether or not we have reached an optimal solution by checking whether we can further increase the output's value of ez by observing the sign of the coefficients of each of the variables in the objective function. In the algebraic method, when we wrote the objective function in this way, having positive coefficients for any variable indicates that the system has not yet reached an optimum. The reason is that we can further increase the value of the variables so that Z gets a greater value. As a remark, remember that all variables are non-negative. Now, in the tabular form, since we moved all the variables to the left-hand side, instead of searching for positive coefficients, we search for negative coefficients. Here we have negative 3 for x and negative 2 for y. This corresponds to the fact that if I increase the value of x or if I increase the value of y, we can increase the value of z. Therefore, we have not yet reached an optimal solution. Besides, since negative 3 is less than negative 2, Hopefully, the value of z will increase faster if we increase the value of x. In conclusion, we select the variable with the most negative coefficients in row 0, that is x in this case. Thus, our target is to increase the value of x now. This means that we are going to transform x to be a basic variable and it's going to replace one of the basic variables here. Referring to the algebraic method, at this moment, we shall check to what extent I can ex increase the value of x by observing what restrictions are imposed to x in all the constraints, that is, row 1 and row 2 in our case. Similar to the algebraic method, we check by comparing which constraint gives more restriction on the increase of x. This can be done by dividing the right-hand side constant by the corresponding coefficients of x in each of the constraint rows, knowing that y is now 0 and the basic variables s1 and xs2 can be reduced as much as to 0. So for the first row, the ratio of ci divided by the coefficient of x will be 6 over 2 equals to 3. And for the second row, the ratio of ci divided by the coefficient of x would be x over 1, which is 8. Since 3 is less than 8, we know that the first row of the constraint gives the most limitation on the growth of x. The column representing x is called the key column. One important thing to note here is that in case we come across constraints having negative coefficients for x, for example, imagine that instead of positive 2, we have negative 2 here, then it means that x can increase to a greater value without any limitation in this constraint because with whatever amount of increase in x, it will make it more negative and we can still fit the equation by increasing the value of other variables in the same constraint in an appropriate amount. Therefore, this kind of constraint doesn't give any limitation on the growth of x and we can simply ignore this row when making the comparison. In this case, we will only bother about the second constraint which gives positive x and because this is a positive number, so we will choose second row as the constraint which gives the most limitation on the increase in x 
and we can ignore the first row when performing the comparison. In another situation, imagine that in case we are come across constraints such that the coefficient of x is zero, it means that there is no limitation on x at all in this constraint because this constraint does not relate with x. Therefore, we can also simply ignore this row when making the comparison. For example, if we happen to have this case in our system, then we can just consider the ratio of x over 1 for the second row, and because this is a positive value, so this gives the greatest limitation on the increase of x. Returning back to our original problem, we have identified row 1 to be the constraint that gives the most limitation on the increase in x. This means that x will replace s1 to be the basic variable. Now we are going to transform our system into another one, and thus we will change our table. First, we scale row 1 appropriately so that the coefficient of x becomes positive 1. So in our case, we divide row 1 by 2 to get this new row. This corresponds to the procedure of making x as the subjects of this constraint equation in the algebraic method. In the algebraic method, what we do next was to substitute x into all other places containing x. So we substitute x to the objective function and to other constraints. The same effect can be achieved here by performing Gaussian elimination. Our target is to make all the coefficients of x in other rows to be zero using this red row. So for each of these target rows, which is row 0 and row 2, we add a suitable multiple of row 1 to each of these rows. For the row 0 that represents the objective function, we will apply 3 times row 1 to it to get this row. And for the second row, which represents the second constraint, we apply negative 1 of the first row to this row to get this row. Therefore, we can rewrite our system as this one. Let's hold on and have a little check. Let us ignore row 0 at the moment and inspect all those constants for CI in all constraint rows. They should be all non-negative. The reason is that we have chosen the row which gives the greatest limitation on the increase of x. So when we apply this row to rewrite the other rows, this constant should not be reduced to less than zero. If we observe negative values among constants in the constraint equation, it's a signal that we may have done some careless mistake. One careless mistake may be we scaled the target row when we add a multiple of the red row to it. For example, imagine that instead of having negative row 1 plus row 2, we get row 1 minus row 2 to apply to the row 2 here, then we will have negative 5 here in CI, and this will be a mistake. So be careful that we should not scale the target row itself when we apply a multiple of the red row to it. It should be just the red row that makes changes and apply to the target rows. Returning back to our case, we have got a second system. Now we shall go through the procedure in a similar fashion as the previous system. We are about to solve 
for a solution in this system, and we expect to get y equals to zero and s1 equals to zero. We will get this solution. We can conclude that this system is not yet optimal since the coefficients of y in the objective function, that is the zero row here, is negative. Therefore, our target now is to increase y. The column with y will be the key column. Again, we search for those constraint rows which have positive coefficients for y and pick the row which gives the smallest value when the ratio ci divided by the coefficients of y in that row is the smallest and pick the row which gives the smallest value when we divide ci with the coefficient of y in that row. In our case, the constraint that limits the most to the increase of y is the second constraint because the ratio is the minimum. So y will replace s2 to be the basic variable. We perform row operation as in Gaussian elimination. So we scale the second row appropriately so that the coefficients of y becomes positive 1. In this case, we multiply row 2 by 2 over 3 to get this new row. For other rows, we apply a suitable multiple of this new row 2 to each of the other rows so that the coefficients of y in other rows become 0. This corresponds to substituting y into the objective function and all other constraints containing y. In our case, we will multiply half of row 2 to row 1 and negative half of row 2 to row 1. We get the following system. And this is the third system we get. Now we observe that in this system, there is no longer negative coefficients in any variables in row 0, that is the objective function, anymore. Knowing that if we take s1 equals to 0, s2 equals to 0, x equals to 4 over 3, y equals to 10 over 3, and z equals to 32 over 3, we cannot further increase z anymore. Therefore, the optimal solution is reached with these values. Therefore, for our original problem, the objective function fxy equals to 3x plus 2y has a maximum value of 32 over 3, which is achieved by taking x equals to 4 over 3 and y equals to 10 over 3.